right, so while Enrique uh, gets us set up, I'll be the first one to say thank you. That's, I think, one of the last storage presentations for the day. How many people here are storage guys or gals? We know Ray and Enrique. That's, that's you know, that's kind of, you know, they're, they're some of the originators of Storage Field Day and that inaugural event. One of my first Tech Field Day events was Storage Field Day. And these guys are in there talking about how bits are written to a, uh, to storage, and I'm like, who cares about this stuff? <laughs> to the level of uh, uh, Enrique, Howard Marks, Ray, I'm like, oh my God, I'm in the wrong event. So I was, I was getting to that point here, but it looks like uh, the second half, we are saved. I'll present, <laughs> and we won't talk about, uh, I promise you I will not talk about NVMe I think that's how it's pronounced, fabrics or SSDs or anything like that. We're going to take the conversation up a level, but not too far. Uh, real life story. Who in here has started to implement some type of HCI, hyperconverged infrastructure, be it vSAN, Nutanix, any of those guys, because they just need to move faster? So a couple. Who's looked into it? Because we're getting a lot of pressure from the enterprise to move faster and enable capability. We'll get into this in one of my slides. But I want to share a, a, kind of a true story. I, I've changed the names a little bit and adjusted the story just to make sure I don't break any NDAs. But a company was looking at rolling out an extremely aggressive product. The, they had this internal project. They came in and was like, you know what? It takes six months to provision data center resources, to get something, to order something, get it into the data center, get it racked and stacked, get OSs installed, get it through all the change management, and then get it to the development team. Common problem we have in the enterprise. So what they did was they said, you know what? Let's buy into this talk of the HCI vendor, and we'll look at moving faster because if we have the full stack, all we have to do is rack and stack. They get into the project, order the equipment, go, go through procurement, the, compute, the equipment hits the data center floor, they go to rack and stack the equipment, and the rails don't fit into the rack. Typical story we run into the enterprise all the time. We have this legacy model for how we provide services. And as we tr try to implement some of this new stuff into our brownfields, we run into this stuff typically. So that's what this talk is about. It's about taking these abstracted data center concepts. When you look at the agenda, this is about the abstracted data center. The title is the impact of digital transformation on IT. We'll get into how those two kind of come together. And we look at some of these pitfalls, we talk through it. I don't have all the solutions. I'm dealing with some of these problems day to day. I'm here to highlight as you start your journey, some of the things that you can look at, uh, some of the products potentially you can take a look at and talk through some of the challenges you might get involved in. So with that teaser, a little introduction to myself, kind of what gives me the any type of authority to talk about this other than the fact that I know that you need to make sure if your PDUs are not positioned well in the rack, you won't be able to fit HCI into your data center to begin with. I'm the principal at CTO Advisor, thectoadvisor.com. I run a blog and podcast on that site. Uh, that's basically the extent of the CTO Advisor. You can find me on Twitter at CTO Advisor. Quick career highlights. I've been in this thing quite a while. I, uh, I don't know if Novell even expires certifications anymore, so I'm still, I still claim I'm a NetWare uh, 4.1 CNE, so career started early. Uh, spent a lot of time in what we call traditional industry. Moved on to Lockheed Martin a few years ago after I acquired my uh, undergrad and then eventually my graduate's degree. Uh, I was the program chief architect for Lockheed Martin's HITS program, that's the housing and urban development. So I was the uh, enterprise architect basically for the uh, urban housing development, pretty big 
federal organization, about 12,000 users, as well as some other Lockheed Martin cloud initiatives. I spent two years completely out of IT. I like to call this my time in exile. PwC, awesome company, but if you go into one of these environments where you uh, are no longer a technologist and you're a management consultant, you start to get a different view of IT. I like to call it, while us technologists, and we talked an awful lot about storage, so while we're arguing over iSCSI versus NFS versus Fiber Channel with the networking team and the storage team and the compute team that are talking about the advantages of vSAN, HCI, hyperconverged, software-defined storage, these conversations are, okay, should we outsource all of IT? And it's a very different type of conversation, very different type of tools. Now, I've returned quite a bit back to my pure technologist ways. The whole play on CTO advisor is I'm no, I'm no longer a pure technologist anymore at this point in my career, and I'm also not a CIO type. So I'm kind of stuck in between where I can advise CTOs on their strategy around their enterprise data center and infrastructure progress. And that's what I think the target of this will be. Also, I uh, blog and, and talk in and, uh, techtarget, techrepublic.com. You'll find some of my stuff on there as well as the uh, regular blog. I think this is a driving statement. The folks that coined the term software, def software is eating the world. We are running into this problem from a digital transformation perspective on the infrastructure part, side of the house. We are running to, into this problem head on. A16Z, Adresen Horowitz, coined this term, cloud, public cloud enables small companies to disrupt entrenched incumbents. What exactly does that mean? No matter what space you work in, you can, life sciences is my date, daytime job, uh, it can be manufacturing, anything. The barrier of entry that cloud provides into a market really enables small competitors to come and basically eat the lunch of the larger incumbents. We see this in the taxi. Who took an Uber over to here today? Wow, that's, that's a nice number of people. My mom actually Ubers. Uh, which was, uh, you know, I, I, I found this as a shock. She came over and she was showing my 20 X year old son all of the fancy things on how you uh, uh, maximize Uber, which my son was like, you know, my grandma is an Uber expert. <laughs> but let's think about that. My mom, who has a crocheting business, this, this is her primary business, is a crocheting business, it's about as old school as you can get. She takes, you know, she, she was telling me, you know, I can optimize my business by 200% if I buy a loom. Not, I'm not talking about, you know, a, a lun, a loom, like literally an old school loom where she can crochet faster. And, but to that, she was talking about all of these strategies, strategies she's using with social media, websites to market her products and compete, and now she's selling high-end crochet uh, pieces on the web at a premium, and she's competing against the Walmarts, Walmarts of the world. You know, we talk on the Uber scale, and we talk about Uber a lot, that Uber has done this. They, they, they've abstracted away their IT to the point where they can challenge incumbents, the taxi industries of the world. You know, you fly into a Chicago, a, a city like Chicago, you get into a long taxi line at O'Hare, uh, you wait a half an hour to get a cab, you get in the cab, the experience is kind of maybe so-so, and you, get to, you eventually get to your location, and then there's, if, if you didn't have a great experience, not really much you can do to, about it, that's the experience. Uber comes in, you know, Uber, Five minutes later, I, you know, while everyone else is standing in that taxi line, I'll hop over to the shared white ride, pick up, get in. If I don't like my experience, I can just instant feedback and, and Uber kind of magically takes care of that in the back end. I might get the credit back, but there's recourse. Software is eating the world. That directly impacts 
our relationship with the business from an IT perspective. We're starting to see a morph of the CIO, CTO position. Me and Ethan, who Ethan Banks will uh, talk a little bit later about a uh, tangent topic, network transformation. We had this conversation over on his show, Data Knox, about the morphing of the CIO position within the traditional enterprise. Enterprise vendors have always had this concept of the CTO, someone who's in charge of making sure the product, whether it's storage arrays, what we were talking about today, uh, virtualized storage, backup, these technology products are aligned with what their customers are doing. The CIO slash CTO in today's business, their role is starting to morph into a position where they have to be aligned with the business. The very reason why we're looking at, at the engineer level, the HCI, automation, et cetera, et cetera, is so that we can enable the business to compete against the Ubers and my mom, <laughs> basically. So functionally, from a infrastructure perspective, we're being asked to move faster, be stronger, <laughs> I love the story about Net, uh, Netflix a few Christmases ago. Uh, you know, Netflix's infrastructure is famously, most of it was at the time was in AWS, and they had this major outage during Christmas time. You know, that was not driven by a bad patch. It wasn't driven by a lack of uh, infrastructure or a bad uh, piece of hardware. That was basically a failure of change control. The folks at Netflix uh, were making a change. The folks at AWS were making a change. And the changes didn't meld together. So even though AWS was extremely good in their processes and uh, Netflix was extremely good in their processes, as the industry changes, we're asked to make sure that not only do we add more capability, but we keep the same amount of resiliency in our data center. And this is no longer, be, this is no longer just a five, six, nines, you know, do we have enough power supplies? Do we have enough network connections? Do we have enough disk arrays? Do we have redundant data centers? No, we're asked to move up a stack and talk through the processes of integrating our services with third parties. So we're asked to be stronger and more stable than we are today. We're asked to do more with less. We are asked to add net new, these are net new things. Our jobs are being expanded without us asking. You know, the other day, I, I'm sure it happens to you, they said, they came into my office or my cube and said, Keith, congratulations. You're no longer over SAP, but you're also over R&D uh, discover, uh, discovery for uh, helping to uh, get our products manufactured or discovered more quickly. No new title, no new money, just, hey, you're, <laughs> here's your new responsibility. Uh, I'm like, okay, that sounds like two jobs, but that's effectively what we're being asked to do. The challenge, the money challenge, this slide hasn't changed probably over the past 30 years when it comes to enterprise IT. 80% of our budgets, this is a rule of thumb, 80% of our budgets are keeping the lights on. It's going to be our Cisco maintenance contracts, our renewing, our buying new uh, spend dues for existing storage arrays, maintenance on storage arrays, people cost, just keeping doing what we do today and continuing to do what we to do today well. And then 20% of our budget is spent on innovation. Well, you guys have seen a couple of cool pro products today. The, I don't mind saying the stuff that primary data is doing. I was at uh, Storage Field Day 5 before they released the actual product, and they were talking about this whole uh, storage virtual, the virtualized data, and you know, I'm like, okay, whatever, I'm not a storage guy. I understand my data requirements, but that's the interesting solution. Uh, and then even the guys at Pure who, uh, who have been doing amazing stuff on the array side, we need money, that's innovation. If we're gonna bring that stuff in, what they talk about is how do we enable the business 
to better and faster deliver. Well, in order to do that, if we have an existing EMC array, HDS, we, have, uh, uh, we just don't even have the use case for the primary data use case. And Veeam will talk about talking about backing up your existing virtualized environment and still adding net new capability. Surprisingly, that old stuff doesn't go away. This is net new stuff. In addition to your pure arrays and everything else that you have, you still have your regular operations, that brownfield stuff you have to manage. So how do we fix this 80-20 rule? We have to optimize our budget. You know, this is, there, there's no magic in here. This is just like data gravity. If there's an awful lot of data and there's a massive amount of compute that needs to happen on that data, you have to get the data close to the compute. There might be tricks to make that happen, whether it's caching, whatever, but overall, these are not complex things. We'll throw some Citrix at the problem, we'll throw technologies, but the underlying resolution is, is all the same. So for technology, our technology budgets, none of this is changing. We have to optimize that 80%. The, the sciences around this haven't changed. We're either going to outsource it uh, to a traditional, whether that's outsourcing to a traditional housing uh, outsourcing provider, which we'll not talk about, because that's going out of fashion. We've, we, we've gone through another cycle where we understand, we still see you know, big uh, outsourcing deals in, in the industry, but we can look at our big enterprise vendors HPE is kind of exiting that business. IBM is going to try and exit that services business. The, all that stuff is, th that's not the future. The future is where we see the investment being made in, which is hosting, public cloud, uh, and transformation, which we'll talk a little bit about automation. So let's talk about the big elephant in the room, which is cloud, which is the, what, what we've been trying to couple with, whether it's shadow IT or our CIO, CTO, senior manager just coming to our office and saying, thou shalt do cloud. There are some advantages to doing cloud. There's a lower barrier entry. Again, the Ubers, my mom, you know who loves cloud? My mom. That's, that if you guys have young, young kids, you'll, you'll get that joke. Uh, reduce system administration cost. You know, we move up a layer. That whole racking of stacking of equipment, that, that's a problem we, know, we should no longer have to deal with the challenges of racking and stacking at some point in our data centers. All of that administrative minutia should be moved outside of our pre preview. However, the cons are ample. Unpredictable cost. I think this whole VMware and AWS announcement where you can run your VMware software-defined data center inside of an AWS enclave. That's interesting, but again, one of the first things that I came to mind was cost. Can I control my cost as well as I can control those costs in my private data center? Those are questions I have yet, yet to uh, hear the answer for. And some of the hidden technical burdens. I've talked about the uncertainty of kind of the change management piece of it. But in this room, we're technologists. For the most part, we understood the NVMe fabric discussion. It's a network. It's a protocol running over the network. We understand those protocols. It's Ethernet. If, if Ethernet breaks, we go onto our data center and we fix Ethernet. We lose that visibility with cloud. All of that is abstracted over. While this topic is about the abstracted data center, we lose some of the visibility in those tools. We don't have those low level tools that we had before. We can run a Wireshark on our uh, AWS entities in AWS, but what we get won't, won't help us troubleshoot the problem. That doesn't tell us uh, what's happening on the AWS physical infrastructure. We need tool, toolings and training to help us through these problems. I'm not here with the answers in this small 25 minute talk. I'm here to highlight some of the challenges that you'll face when looking at either one of these options. So cloud isn't a panacea when, when we talk about optimizing costs. 
We can optimize costs with cloud, but we have to be selective. It is a, it's one of the many tools in our tool belts that we can have. We can't just click and move our data center to the cloud and expect to save money. And then lastly, oh, we're running low on power. Let's talk about transformation, big transformation within our uh, data center walls. We have automation. And one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we talk about when it comes to automation is day two. A lot of what we hear about automation is around the AWS type of use case where a developer takes out a credit card, swipes the debt credit card, and magically they have a workload and they're up and running. That, yes, absolutely that adds value. However, how often is that really a use case in your environment? Most of us have pretty stable environments. So we're not, when there's pressure to stand up a new uh, workload or new environment, there's a lot of pressure to do so. However, we don't do it quite often. What we do a lot of is day two administration. So a lot of change management. Uh, so we'll get a request to add a new VIP. We'll get a new request to add, to extend a file system in Linux. Uh, we'll get a request to uh, provision a new storage line. Uh, we'll get a request to change or uh, 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 to change a, some uh, Unix variables or system variables. Those are the type of things we do every day, all day. Those are the types of changes that come across our desk every day. Those are the things that we should look at automating. So looking at tools like Ansible, Chef, Puppet, to do the everyday stuff that really that our teams and we are spending a lot of time on. So automation, not just provisioning. Software-defined infrastructure. We've heard this term infrastructure as code before. Normally when we hear it, we usually think of the Amazons and the AWS's, well, Amazon, AWS, Facebook, Google, as talking about infrastructure as code. There's a reason why the storage providers talk about uh, RESTful a APIs. We need to start using leveraging tools like Microsoft's uh, uh, Power, PowerShell to automate our infrastructure or treat our infrastructure as code. Version one of our infrastructure, version 1.1 of our infrastructure. We have the tools to do this with our legacy environments now. We can take, uh, the, Chris Wall has a really cool open source project called Vesta where he can, where you can test your environment for a condition, your entire vSphere environment for a condition to make sure all of your vSphere hosts are, have the right configuration, such as NTP, network time protocol, uh, or DNS. Chances are if you're having a vSphere problem, 90% uh, of the time it's either a DNS issue or a network time protocol issue. Just, that's just the way VMware vSphere is. If you have 30, 40, 50, 60 hosts, how do you check that across all those hosts? Through the VMware's policy manager or through this Vespa, Vesta project in which you can just write a condition, test for that condition, and then change your infrastructure based on your desired state. Mm -hmm. VMware vSphere, we're not talking about vCloud, VMware vRealize, none of these fancy terms that we see out in the market or products. We're talking about PowerShell, which we own if we're a uh, Microsoft customer, and PowerShell, which we can get for free if we use Linux because it's now open sourced. These are the mindsets we need to start moving towards. Now, as we look at spending money, workload optimization, again, getting the most out of what we have today. Chances are, if you're like any other environment, you're over-provisioned. You have way more CPU than you have. If you're lucky, you have, you have more memory than what you need. And you most definitely almost always have more storage that you need. It's just getting those puzzles in the right slots. Looking at products like Cloud Physics, which is a paid product, 
or VMware DRS. We all, if we have a VMware environment, chances are we have the minimum uh, software licensing level that we own DRS. I couldn't tell you how many customers, peers I've run into that just still don't trust DRS. It's time to get past that level of uncomfortability. We're asked to do more with less. If you're still manually figuring out what workloads needs to go on what uh, cluster or host, I'm, tell, I'm here to tell you now you're doing it wrong. And you won't, you won't keep up with my mom. This is all about how do you keep up with my mom. Your business will not keep up with my mom if you're still trying to manually figure out what, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a spreadsheet mapping lawns to disks to applications, all that stuff was great a few years ago, but if you're still doing that, you are not, you're not doing your job. We need to move higher up the stack, and that's what this presentation was about. Time for questions? And it's right on time because the, it ran out of uh, juice. <laughs> In your experience as a CTO advisor, have you seen uh, big enterprise companies? It's doubtful that they will put all of their infrastructure on AWS or Azure. Have you seen the uh, adoption by these uh, big enterprise companies who want to own their own data, who want to have their own data centers, use a tool to make their own private cloud so that they have the uh, uh, functionality of an AWS, but under their own terms, like using like a tool like OpenStack, for Yeah, instance. so obviously the OpenStack conference is happening right now. Companies like GE, uh, Comcast, really big name companies that are still having their own data center and trying to integrate those into other data centers, into public cloud uh, services. I think what I didn't get a chance to talk through is this whole hybrid cloud thing. I don't believe in hybrid cloud not as a typical use case. You're not going to have typically this model where you have your own data center and you burst out to another data center and then burst back in. That, I, I think we've proved that is not a valid use case. What is a valid use case is that we have these bolt-on uh, cloud native digital transformation applications where we have sitting out in the cloud and in the cloud proper and we start to learn that we like that programming uh, capability. And we start to build that type of capability within our own data center with an OpenStack. The challenges become integrating operations. Our challenge, most of the people in this room, is how do we monitor apps? How do we uh, ensure performance? How do we address issues like latency and bandwidth problems? Those are the types of things that I'm seeing in large enterprises. The whole burst out thing they don't see, but most definitely the need to have that cloud native capability uh, separate from what they have in a public cloud. <laughs> Any other question? Um, n not as so much a question for Keith, but just a comment on uh, for the gentleman that just asked the question. Um, you know, I work for TDA. It's the TD Ameritrade, fairly large company. Just bought Scott Trade. It's going to be even bigger. And uh, there was, you know, I don't think I, it, I'm telling any secrets here by saying that financial services has been something of a laggard in terms of the cloud, right, mm -hmm. for regulatory and other reasons. But uh, we recently convinced the Mukti Mucks, if you will, <laughs> to, to consider cloud by deploying uh, an, an application in a on-prem pivotal cloud foundry uh, fashion, right? And then that one's now in the cloud and the next one's coming into the cloud soon. So so that, I think that strategy actually works fairly well, or can work, I should oh, say. Oh, so, so uh, you said you were working with TD Ameritrade? Yes, sir. So they're using cloud foundry as their that uh, was a cloud. that was a uh, actually a pilot project. We've right. kind of moved beyond that, but that was the that was sort of the first way to, you know, give people experience with twelve factor apps. Uh, you know, use S three storage, right. et, yep. cetera, et cetera. So you know, I okay. see a lot of people looking at. Enrique uh, has taught me a lot about this. So you'll see a lot of people trying to get S three inside of their data center so that their developers can develop against that. And then at some point they may have that outside of their data center and, and move. So they'll take this thing where they, they'll build it internally and then move it to the public cloud, which is surprising. Most people think they start on a public cloud and then maybe move it internally, but they build cloud-like capability and then take the app 
and lift and shift it to the cloud, but not burst to the cloud. Exactly. It's all about trust, right? Yes. All right. If there's no other questions, thanks a lot. Thank you.